and welcome back to the studio. Um, we have heard three great talks. Uh, we've got many great questions, but there are still questions from the audience um, left unanswered. Plus, we, uh, we've been having a lot of very spirited debates here on the uh, back channel um, while, uh, while on the break. So I think we're going to have a really good chat. Let's bring out uh, our panelists. Uh, three of them uh, you will recognize from the talks that we just gave. Uh, we, we just uh, we just see we have uh, Carolyn, Margareta, and Kenny Bolo. Uh, hey, uh, and then we have a couple of new joiners. Uh, we have Jane Stone from Futurist, and we have the inimitable Bibro uh, Juho, uh, who is uh, one of the main organizers or the main organizer of React Finland. Hey guys. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hey, uh, so let's get uh, immediately rolling with this question because, like this one, I think you know, seem to seem to you know at least uh, have some uh, have some spirit behind it. Is there such thing as bad documentation? And let me define it by so bad that it would be better not to have any documentation at all than whatever this pile of crap that you call documentation. Do we have any uh, any thoughts on that from panel? If I understood the question correctly, I think I've had a case of when the documentation was so misleading that it would be better not to have it. Uh, specifically uh, in the documentation, it was a specific requirement to use a design system that wasn't really ready to be used. And it, it was like a requirement for the project. So once we went to try to use it, we just wasted a huge amount of time because it wasn't usable in the first place. So yeah, those type of cases, like it would have been better not to have it than to how have did it that in the first place. How did that even end up in the documentation? Like who puts that in there if it cannot be used? What's the, what's the malfunction? Uh, I think I signed an NDA for that project. I'm not sure how much information I can give you about this, but yeah, that definitely has happened. And I think uh, it was an honest misunderstanding in the team. I don't think it was done on purpose, of course. But uh, generally speaking, I think uh, like the type of documentation that falls under the requirements for the project, it should be treated like very carefully because you can waste a lot of precious development time by misleading them, essentially. So I'm I'm generally a bit hesitant uh, when it comes to questions like this because uh, having worked with engineers and still working with engineer and being an engineer myself, I know how easily we can take this to heart and just say, well, I might be bad at writing documentation, so how about I don't just write it at all instead of writing crap. So whilst it's it's actually good to talk about this, I think it's also important to state that whilst um, bad documentation is not a good thing and it's better not to even have documentation instead of having bad documentation um this this is not a reason for you to say okay i'm probably not going to be able to write good documentation so i might as well just not write documentation i think it's better to write it let's let others say it's bad than to decide that i'm not going to write anything because you know uh i think my documentation will be bad so like uh, it's in general, you never know um, how bad it will be uh, until you write it. So first of all, do it. And possibly if you use some resources, you might not um, write something bad. So in summary, I'm just saying um, what, what uh, Margarita has said is not that you should not write documentation at all so that our audience doesn't <laughs> misunderstand this. We're just saying that in certain cases, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's good that uh, it's better off when there's no documentation than having documentation that misleads you. I think so it's I also, had, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure you're first. Yep. No, I was just going to say, I think it's also a question of like, what type of documentation are we talking about? Like, I think there are certain things that are so essential to projects. Like, how do I install your package? Like, that is what I want to know. Is it, you know, if we consider like bad documentation, bad, like documentation that is maybe very minimal and not super like guiding and helpful, I would much rather you throw a list of commands in there so that I can use your product rather than there being nothing at all. And I think it's important to mention that like, if you do write documentation and you give people a feedback method, like a way that people can read your documentation and give you immediate feedback and 
let you know if it's useful or not, then even if you write something that is maybe quote unquote bad, you will get that feedback and be able to iterate on that. So I think I fall on the end of like, I would rather there be something than nothing. I think yeah, there's sorry. one person on this call who has like a unique perspective in hearing that their project has bad documentation and that's Juho. Uh, Juho, you, you were involved heavily in the early stages of Webpack and Webpack documentation today is fantastic. And I think the effort that the community has done on it is incredible. But you, you, you probably heard your share of feedback. How does that feel? And uh, was that actual feedback motivational to, to uh, you know, get it to the great state that it is today? So uh, that, that's the, that's why I became a writer. That's why I wrote my books because Webpack documentation was so bad. It it was the perfect excuse for me to start writing about it. Like what I started was a cookbook, and then it became a book about Webpack and React, and then React book and Webpack book, and so so it's actually a good thing to have bad documentation because it it, it can motivate people to improve it. What I wanted to say earlier was that uh, bad documentation. Is not bad for everyone. Uh, what I mean by this is that consider that you're a developer of Webpack or you're a developer of Blender or something like something complicated, and you're writing the documentation from your perspective that you know the product, you, you know how the software works. So you're writing something that makes sense for you, but at the same time you don't real, realize that it doesn't make sense for every for anyone else or for the beginners or the people that don't know concepts. Uh, that's one of the reasons when we restructured Webpack documentation is that we were thinking about like what's missing. Like there was missing uh, conceptual information. Like you had to explain the concepts before you can understand the documentation. Like it's uh, you might have uh, like uh, good documentation, but it's hidden behind something that's blocking people from understanding. And the challenge is uh, unblocking people for for from uh, understanding the content. So, yeah, I don't know if that, if that answers the question, but uh, uh, when you consider something is bad, it's good to consider why it's bad. Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, uh, James, do you have, um, do you wanna weigh in on this one or should we move to our next question? Sure, I think the one thing I would say about losing this word bad documentation, like like sometimes we throw words around, right? Bad or it's wrong, but, but it's not very specific and it's a bit subjective, right? So is it maybe inaccurate or outdated or confusing? Like there's a lot of different things that could lead to um, bad or poor documentation. But I think the, the one counterpoint I'd like to say is that there's this idea sometimes the source code should be strong enough, right? It should be good enough to just jump into the source. And I think this is too much. Like if you're going that direction, like you have to introduce people into the project in a way and introduce people into your source code in a way that is friendly and at least gives them kind of an entry point, not just the source code. Yeah, I think like one, one sort of trend that I've seen over the last couple of years is uh, uh, when GraphQL as a technology is becoming adopted by the React community, one of the kind of tropes that you know we we often say is like, oh, with GraphQL you can use graphical. Like as long as your you know your your comments and your annotations are good enough, you don't need API documentation. Uh, and I personally call bullshit on that. Um, do we have anybody who actually believes that that is uh, true even a little bit? I think you're absolutely spot on. That's total BS. <laughs> yeah, and like this, this is uh, this is something that I wanted to get to when we were talking with Margarita, but we had to cut our uh, Q and A short. Was this idea that like we sometimes seem to forget why we react, why we write software, uh, and like nobody is willing to be the adult in the room. Uh, and like documentation. It's very hard, I think. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's generally very hard to write very good documentation for something that you yourself have written because you have all of that context in your head and communicating the essentials of that context is hard in a sense it's it's a good thing just like you have mentioned it's a good thing that there is a community around something and people can point out parts that they don't understand like partially the reason why there is so many articles about, about Webpack, like I even wrote an article about how to configure Webpack a couple of years back, uh, is because uh, people were 
finding it very hard to understand and certain people just went deeper and broke it down and from a perspective of an outsider from a perspective of an actual developer they concocted that sort of formula right so i think sometimes like however ironic that sounds like people from the outside can define better way to document your software than you can yourself which sucks yeah. but that's true <laughs> yeah that, that's the um benefit of having external perspective because you, you say it with new eyes and that what might happen and often happens with software is that it uh, it's not going to end up perfect so there will be mistakes in the design there will be some weird things you would like to change but you cannot before because people are used to the thing so it's uh, i think that's how the competition between tools works that that you get a new tool that's addressing the weaknesses of a, of older one so that that's that's how and it, it exactly one point that you see in, in documentation like consider webpack and then consider parcel and parcel is complete opposite of webpack so it, it's uh, the surface of features you have in parcel is much uh, smaller than in webpack that exposes everything so you get uh, i think i think you get really big differences in 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 terms of tools solving the same problem when it comes to documentation and uh, features Certainly. Um, it doesn't sound like we have uh, a, another clap back on that. But um, you are picking up on something that you said earlier, which was that, you know, you literally wrote the book on Webpack. Um, and, and, and there's this other, um, you know, book, which is the Rust programmer manual, you know, for the for programming language Rust, that is essentially like the documentation for Rust is the book, Rust book. Um, and like, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this when I was reading is that there's an interesting model in which uh, creators or makers could be financially incentivized to write better documentation. If you are like the blessed book and you get to write it and like get, you know, the, the profits. Do you think that that would be like a healthy model or do you think that would, you know, disincentivize people from con contributing to the community and rather just try to rip them off with the crappiest book possible? Uh, I think uh, you might, might need both. Because uh, even with React, uh, you have good documentation for React, but still the documentation you have is not enough for everyone. And what's important to keep in mind that you have lots of different users from uh, with different levels of experience. So maybe for beginners, the official documentation of a project might not be enough. So that then you need a book for beginners that's starting from scratch and getting them to the level that they actually can understand the documentation one day. So I, I think there's market for both. And it, it, the point is that if a project doesn't have good enough documentation, it's quite unlikely to become popular in the first place. So it, it, there's some certain level it, ha it needs to have. Yeah, uh, I, I would definitely agree. And, you know, the good thing about the Rust book is that it is available for free. You don't need to buy the print, um, print copy of it. Um, there is no, uh, no barrier to entry, so to speak. Um, I have an interesting question from the um, from the audience here, which is kind of following maybe up on the GraphQL thing, which is like, what do you think about the concept of using good testing as documentation? Like whether it would be end-to-end uh, -end test, whether it would be like cucumber specs uh, or anything. Can testing, can tests take the place of good documentation? Oh yeah, I want to jump in because I a thousand percent believe, I don't think they can replace documentation, but I think especially for onboarding like internally or getting someone used to a code base, having like really descriptive tests and tests that really guide you through what your user flows are, what your components, like what the ideal behavior of those are can be so helpful. But you know, with that comes with the idea of like, we need to be naming things appropriately, which we've made a lot of jokes about in Slack. And like, you should be writing your it, like it does this, like should be descriptive and really give someone context who doesn't already have it. And yeah, I, I love using testing as a foundation for like internal onboarding and things like that. Uh, I'm I'm also pro testing, but I I believe that when we talk about documentation, we're talking about documentation as a whole and not just uh, a minute component. I think um, testing is uh, should be a fundamental 
part of communicating what your application does. And communication is in this, as we, as I, we all know, is also a fundamental part of documentation. However, I would see testing more in the sense of a complement to your documentation practices, as opposed to it being your actual documentation. Um, again, I'm saying this because developers are very, we are very good at picking specific things and we could just decide, no, we're not going to have a readme, we are just going to have all our tests to be self-explanatory and stuff. So it, it should be a compliment and we should definitely encourage it, but it should not be your main source of documentation. So I, I did something related in a little prototype I wrote this year. So I wrote my own state management system that works on top of HTML. And I didn't sort of write a single test for it. It's super tiny. And the whole point is that I, what I did, I wrote the readme file. And in the readme file, uh, I wrote tiny examples that describe how my solution works. And then what I did next, uh, I wrote the tiny bootstrap that uh, generates an HTML page based on my readme file. And, and what happens next is that these examples become alive. So yeah, my little code I wrote, and then it generates the example, so you can see what it looks like. And there's editor, so you can edit the examples. And that's how I was developing this library. So I was writing examples one by one, extending, thinking about the semantics, thinking about this readme file. And, as, and they're sort of the test at the same time. So it was a very powerful thinking tool for myself, and it, it gave me documentation and, and sort of tests at the same time. So it was a very cool experience for me to see how much I can get out of it by like how, how can i like use read me file for thinking thinking about the library and then i write the implementation to make it work so that was uh i will link you to it later but it's, it was kind of cool way cool experience for me isn't that sorry go ahead i was just gonna say isn't that just writing bdd tests except that they aren't runnable so they're worse yeah i, I think there must be some great weaknesses to this approach but I mean, for me, it was super fun just to write Markdown and, and see how everything comes alive. Yeah, there's the, the extreme of that is, um, um, it, the name of it escapes me now, but um, Andre Stoltz uh, wrote this sort of like a tiny little library for uh, for like sort of like using async data flow. And a lot of it's like sort of like async operator repos, the code is the readme. So it turns out that on on uh, on on GitHub, you can just uh, name a file like readme.js, and it gets picks it picks it up and shows it as a readme on the uh, on, on GitHub. Um, I don't know. Did anybody see that? And and what are your thoughts on that? Like, can code ever be so succinct uh, that it's better just to read it than to uh, you know try to describe it in prose, which always makes it go out of sync eventually. So I would say that's actually an interesting concept. And I was going to point to Yule's library, because if I recall, you did share that in Stack, and I did go ahead to try it. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. I, I will was, put it to the channel. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It was quite descriptive. Uh, I had no idea how that was generated. But now that you mentioned it, I would like to give that a try as well. Um, I, I think that code can be used as a tool, um, but we still need to conquer certain barriers like naming things properly, for example. So before we, we hop on that train, maybe we uh, fix the mess that we actually have as developers uh, and then try to jump into something which could be more productive. Uh, again, uh, until you test, you never until you tr try these paradigms, you never really can say if they have more pros than cons or more cons than pros. Well, jumping right. back uh, to your question about Andre, I think that's definitely his philosophy in life, in a sense, like, like it's open source, so you might as well read the source. I think that's his like perspective on the open source code in general. And I respect it. I, I understand his perspective and why he chooses like, the, to go that way. But at the same time, I'm not sure whether I would use it in practice on the project that I'm creating. You like, see what I mean? Like, that's not how I usually end up having to check the solutions from my code. 
so it's it's really a question of a chicken and the egg like 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 yes you might as well not do it but would you reach the goal that you're trying to reach here i don't know i think generally what would be a cool thing is that if people who have used alternative solutions for state management would write like a small tutorial or like the use case when they used it and this way they could popularize it right in a sense without like of course that's a lot to ask right like not everybody wants to be a technical writer but still that would be a very cool way to popularize something that has helped you on the way instead of just saying hey guys check this out i guess yeah, it, it occurs to me that the three last questions that we talked about, whether GraphQL replaced documentation, whether test replaced documentation, or whether code replaced documentation, are just different ways of asking, can I please, please, please not write documentation? Uh, and the answer is, anybody got an answer for this? No. Thank you. you have Thank to you write so much. <laughs> the resounding no for sure. <laughs> All right, so let's assume that you have to write docs. Um, one of the reasons why people, you know, don't want to write docs and they want to use tests or GraphQL schemas is that, you know, like documentation always goes out of sync with code. I think that's like a natural sort of like an entropy kind of thing. And we have a question from um, uh, from uh, Daniel Uhl, uh, which is, if I have a separate repo for my doc site, is there a clever way to tie code PRs to docs updates? So essentially the question is, you know, is it, you know, is, is documentation a good reason to go monorepo or is there a multi-repo solution to this? I feel my answer would be a bit biased, um, but that's also because I'm pro monorepo <laughs> and obviously this is one of the advantages that you get uh, from using that. So I would say, yes, it's a very good reason to go um, monorepo. Um, because of course with Markdown, you can actually link files um, from wherever you want, which gives you a whole, opens up a whole new set of possibilities um, with regards to how you manage your docs folder as well. So for me, yes, it's definitely a good reason to go pro monorepo. I think if you, like going to the idea of like how, if you do, like say you already decided not to go monorepo and you have these multiple repositories, I think having documentation be in your definition of done for your ticket, for your feature, whatever, can help you at least remember to go to that other thing. That doesn't really help as far as like, ideally we'd like to make one PR and have that PR like consist everything in it. But I think at least having that kind of, that having it documented somewhere that you need documentation and having that be part of the process helps you remember to sync in those other resources. I'm thinking more about like Google Drive or Notion. Like just link it there and there you go, you're done. Like, I mean, okay. Let me, let me actually, let, let, let me pick up on that. Cause you said something really interesting, which is like Google Docs or Notion. Um, you know, those are tools that, you know, like people often use for like internal documentation. Uh, but we typically don't tend to use them for public documentation, even though both platforms uh, provide a kind of like option to have a public document available to them. Would you, you know, would you go as, you know, sort of create, well, sorry, I don't want to use that word. Would you go as, as sort of like full on as to write your uh, documentation for your open source project in Notion and just tell people to go and like visit that Notion workspace? Yes, I actually did that for my side project. Recently, I even have like a board for my side project there in Notion. Like it's just easier for me because it, it it's it, it's a microservice architecture. So there is no way for me to like keep it any other way in one place. Uh, plus there has to be a domain description and like, okay, where, where do you place the domain description in the back end, in the front end, in one of your microservices? Are you doing it somewhere else separately? There were so many questions. So it's just easier to have just one place. Like maybe I've even neglected like the readme, the, the official files, just because it's just easier for me to put everything in there. But I'm curious Perfectly about, solution. oh, sorry. I was okay. just thinking, I'm curious about if you use, like my issues I've had with things like Google Docs or Notion or things that aren't, like don't have any sort of version control is how do you, you know, 
how do you kind of see the evolution? Like if you need to refer to something, mm. like someone has a question about old systems. I don't know. That's always been mm. my question. Google Docs has a version control. There is history of the doc document and there is comments that you can make. Uh, not sure about Notion though. I've never really tried to see the version control of the documentation. I think uh, like we're talking about different parts here of documentation because like the topic is like so broad, right? Like we're talking about design systems, tests here that also include documentation, the readme's. Um, on the broadest level, I think uh, generally speaking, like managing the versions of it doesn't matter all that much if it describes the entire system correctly. I mean, that's that's just my opinion, but but yeah, I don't see that as a problem myself as much. Yeah, I was just curious, genuinely. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say that um, maybe personally for me, um, having the different versions or being able to see the history of how the documentation and in general the product has evolved uh, gives me a better overview of where we're coming from and where we're going, um, and that's because of course. Um, when you take on a lot of external projects, there's what they tell you and there's what actually the code tells you. And a lot of the times you can actually see this from how um, of, over time uh, the documentation has changed and the code has changed and then you can compare with what you're being told as a consultant that, okay, this is what we have done, uh, but the code tells you something different and the documentation tells you something different. So I think personally, um, I find version in especially for docs, um, I find them also super useful as well. Uh, I want to pick up on something that you said, um, which was the words as a consultant. Uh, and this question, I'll start with James, because I noticed that you're wearing the Futurist uh, t-shirt and it's a company that I used to work for, so I'm very familiar with it. Do you, do you think that there are like different challenges um, when it comes to documentation, when, you know, like when, when we're talking about like, so like a vendor, uh, client relationship, whether you're an inde independent contractor or or an agency, like doesn't it, you know, like is, is there any kind of unique challenges around you know handover and and, and all that, or or should soft, should software documentation be the same no matter who writes it uh, and where and when? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I don't know if it's consulting in general, but but the trend that I've noticed is like larger enterprises. They really want a lot of documentation, but they're they're not really what like I would think of documentation in terms of like software development on the team that I'm working with in particular. So instead of it being kind of how do I use it, like why is it important, like what are the tips and tricks, it gets like really high level and kind of maybe more architectural and into like ideas of like what this organization is thinking about, and, and it kind of becomes more I don't know artifacts, and and I don't know. For me, like it's called documentation, and I think this is maybe why I'm a little bit worried when I hear definition of done is is documentation because I've worked in projects where the definition of done just like keeps expanding, and I think if you expand too far, right, then then the definition of done maybe doesn't get done, right? If things are too vague and not specific, so I don't know exactly how how to address that. I think the idea of what documentation there's like two ideas, like there's this big idea of documentation that's like very high level and maybe doesn't have as much relevance to like you as a developer and engineer on the team working, but then there's the documentation within the team. And I think th there could be lacking in either way. For, for me, when I'm on that team, I think if I can't figure out easily how to do something and I have to like go like on a deep dive into the source and like, you know, take long walks and things like this like like there's really someone should have explained a little bit better so i could get started right i don't think i need to go on some vision quest through the woods to like get started right it should be fairly simple so i think the big mistakes i see is like way too much of this like very high level documentation big emphasis on it and i don't know that there's a lot of value at least on the team to creating this or maybe it could be done in a more like MVP approach and then the other thing that happens is like on the team level there's almost like a complete avoidance of documentation or maybe maybe sometimes trying to emulate what they think documentation is so it's not really thinking about from the mindset of what someone needs to know coming into the project or like what are the tips and tricks but sometimes you know I think someone was saying earlier 
like when you write the software yourself, you, you have this bias, right? Like, like how can you get past the bias? I think when somebody new comes into the team and you have to explain, that's maybe a good time to expose the bias and kind of find out what are the things that are missing. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, you shouldn't knock vision quests. I think like, you know, if as part of like onboarding process, uh, this is a comment from Yohis. If there's a vision quest that you need to take in the woods in order to be onboarded to software project, I think I would be more likely to work for that company. I think that sounds like a fun place. But now I, I believe that we're veneering uh, what in Finland we call sauna time. Uh, and so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't drag this uh, too much uh, past our time. Uh, but I do want to I just ask one final question, uh, ideally from each of our participants, uh, answer as succinctly as you can. What is the one take home, the one actionable take home from this entire session today um, that you would, uh, you would like our viewers to have? Anyone can start. I think I can start. I think that would be understanding the domain of your project very well then then everything else is going to come then everything else such as whether we're using the right tools whether they're using the right libraries how documentation should form is going to come after this i think i'll, I'll go next um and it will i'll just cycle back to the last theme from my talk um the code you write today is going to be legacy code possibly tomorrow to somebody else um it's going to have to be maintained by someone else. So um, writing documentation is important so that the next person who has to deal with the code base that you leave behind is not going to have to deal with a lot of crap. I would say the biggest takeaway, oh, there's so many, but I would say probably that documentation, creating documentation should be a collaborative process. It should be something that you work with other departments in your organization, you work with your teammates, but maybe via code review, you work with your users and work with their feedback. So. Yeah, I will say it's important to understand who you're writing for, because it, it matters a lot if you're writing for, for beginners or experienced coders or your boss or, or customer. So everyone has different requirements regarding documentation and that's something you should take into account when writing. I think for me, just pay it forward. Like if you come across the bad documentation, just clean it up a little bit. Like you don't have to fix everything. Like, you know, you only have to brush your teeth twice a day for two minutes. So just spend two minutes, fi fix a few things here and there. I think it's a good approach to get started. All right, well, thank you everyone for those uh, pieces of wisdom. Also, thank you so much for your talks.